Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're doing another episode of ICU, and today we're going to talk about pelvic health resources. And I don't even really know where this conversation is going to go, but today I have a guest who founded a resource called Pelvic Health Support. Her name is Marnie Glavin. Welcome to the show, Marnie. Thank you. Happy to be here. That intro is a little bit weird in my language. And for everyone listening, if I sound a bit more nasal than I normally do, it's because my allergies are freaking insane this week. And I feel like I'm actually underwater. So that is why I sound like that. (laughs) Um, And I feel like so many people with IC or at least a subgroup of us like have an issue with like mast cells and histamine and and that can actually be a trigger in itself for bladder flares so yeah I know a lot of people around this time tend to get flare-ups because of the pollen and everything going on out there springtime I know the other day I took a I, I I used to take hydroxyzine nightly for my IC but I decided it wasn't really doing anything for me so I went off of it and took one Sunday night because I was desperate and I woke up to go to a workout class at like 7 15 and I was like a zombie I highly regretted taking that but yeah yeah, it just made me remember there are side effects that come with medications (laughs) I don't know I used to take hydroxyzine um because I have IC as well and it would give me such bad um retention like I couldn't pee Oh, did you not find that? Did that not happen to you? I've all? actually never had any sort of retention, but I've been hearing some some issues with different medications recently. Like one of my clients recently went on amitriptyline and had retention yeah. and also was struggling. Like it, it caused a flare up for her. So mm-hmm. it's like, that's the type of thing that gives people trust issues. <laughs> I know. Amitriptyline definitely does cause some um, retention because um, I take it. I've been taking it way too long. I've got to get off that drug. I've been on it since, oh my God, 2004. Wow. So yeah, so 20 you, years. I was going to say, you, you've had IC for a while. Can you tell the audience a little bit about your journey with that? Yeah, so I was diagnosed in 2003 after having um, symptoms. I think it must have stemmed from a bladder infection that just wouldn't go away. Um, So I was put on multiple antibiotics and I would take one and it did nothing. So the doctor, it was a general practitioner at the time, he would put me on another one. And then after three, I'm like, okay, this is clearly not working. And so that was when they sent me to a urologist. Um, but I remember I was I was traveling with an ex-boyfriend's family and she's like, oh, I bring antibiotics with me when I travel because sometimes I get bladder infection. She's like, why don't you just take mine? I'm like, I'm going to take three. I don't think this is probably the best thing to do. Right. Um, so I was in university. I was in my... I guess it was in my last year. And I remember having to go for a cystoscopy um, in London, Ontario, which is where I went to university, which is just about two hours west of Toronto. And it was the worst experience. I mean, they didn't. So this is the thing I know a lot of the times now when they do cystoscopies, they will not give people a general, which I think is whenever I, I did not have it. Cystoscopy. You never had a cystoscopy? No, like I, I did. I, I didn't have oh. anesthesia. Oh, you didn't? And you were fine? No, it was awful. No, it was I awful. Cried. I cried the whole time and I, I have a high pain tolerance. Terrible. And then they did, did they do the hydro distension? Yeah. So the first, yeah. the first, I had two uh, cystoscopies. The first was with hydro distension. That was under anesthesia. And then the second one, which was the most memorable one, was just a cystoscopy in office. And it was horrible. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I guess it's a cost thing, but it just, when I hear that people have to do, you know, they're just like, oh, we're just going to do a local. I'm just like, oh God, don't do it. Try to get the general. It's right. just such a horrible experience, especially when your bladder is already, you know, not in the best of shape. So it's angry. 
<laughs> well, I, I couldn't tolerate it. They weren't able to finish the procedure. So I have to do it again. So it's like, okay, here's num time number two, which is also why I'm like, you know, just get it done under the, with the general. And that way you don't have to go through the process twice. Um, but I remember I couldn't sit after I went into, a, I took baths. It was just awful. Mm -hmm. So painful. And it also can ca often cause a flare um, post. So then about, I guess maybe it was two or three months later, I did it with a general, which was fine. Um, and then they diagnosed me the second time around um, based on mostly capacity and, you know, pinpoint long relations, but that would happen to most people when they stretch a bladder. So, <clears throat> so for me, um, I don't have so much the pain as I do the the frequency and urgency, nocturia, dyspareunia. Um, those are more of the symptoms that I've been dealing with for the past 20 years. And I've gone, I've kind of waxed and waned. I've had bad periods. I've had good periods. Um, but the reason that I started public health support is a result of there being such a lack of resources out there for people who struggle with pelvic health conditions in general. Um, so I just saw a major need for, you know, having a support system. I mean, people don't really, shouldn't feel like urology is the only answer, right? And that's how I felt. And I think, you know, now public physiotherapy is so much, you know, it's, it's prevalent now and people are doing it. There's so many more public PTs. When I first went, I remember my urologist actually sent me and I had no idea what to expect. Um, I was going yeah, in blind I <laughs> and I just, yeah, I was just like, you're going to do what? And I have to go home with homework and finger myself. And I was just like, okay, so uh -huh. <laughs> this is, yeah. So it, it's just like, I like to help people prepare, you know, a lot of people in the support groups are constantly asking, like, I'm, you know, they're saying I'm scared, what, I don't know what to expect. And so we try to break down, um, what, what they can expect and how they can benefit and what kind of treatment options are available. Um, and I think the thing is with the way the site works is you can be proactive on the site. So you can actually try out multiple things. Like you can try, you know, we teach you how to do an elimination diet. We provide you with recipes like bladder friendly, bladder friendly recipes, anti-inflammatory recipes, gluten-free, dairy-free. Um, we allow you to we provide videos so you can do meditation and breath work or mindful movement, things like um, restorative yoga and physio yoga and Qigong. So, you know, finding what works for you. Um, and I think, you know, if I had known how much the brain um, plays a role in IC 20 years ago, I mean, they don't really tell you that when you go to the urologist, they make you feel like it's a completely tissue based um issue it's it's your bladder it's bladder centric it's not um and not to say your pain isn't real it absolutely is but people need to really understand central sensitization and understanding how the brain can get sensitive when you've been in pain for a long time um and i think you know that's the goal of the site is to help people understand how the biopsychosocial approach works and how the brain works and how the brain is wired um, because I think it's not, it's, it's really not addressed in conventional medicine. Uh, so, you know, that is really the focus of the site. It really is um, helping people understand that. And I just wish I had it 20 years ago, you know, when I was first diagnosed, I really do. Cause you know, the thing is often when you get a chronic illness diagnosis, you're going to go into a depression. It's almost, they almost go hand in hand, right? You're like, here I was in my early twenties, finding out that I had this bladder condition that was chronic and it was uncurable and no one really knew anything about it. And it was just one of those things like I was going to have to learn to live with. I mean, where was the, where was the mental health piece Absolutely. there? Like where was, where was the help in you know, no one told me to, you know, go do yoga, go try meditation, go, um, you know, there were so many things that I could have done, um, but I wasn't informed and I had no idea. And I just was like told here, you've got this condition I see, no one really knows anything about it. 
they used to think it was, you know, back in the day, they called it like, what, what do they say? Like it was, a, it was a crazy person's mm -hmm. diagnosis, um, which is, you know, it's just ridiculous. It makes us crazy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, the bladder is so controlling, right? And I think for me, the biggest struggle has been sleep. Um, and I think, you know, there's been periods where I've had such bad nocturia that I haven't had quality sleep. And then that obviously affects you in every aspect of your life if you're not sleeping properly. And I think so many people with IC struggle with that, right? Getting up multiple times in the night. How are you going to get your your REM or deep sleep right. if you're constantly getting up? So yeah. I see so many people struggling with that. And and luckily I have it. I mean, I did when I was a freshman in college. After my hydrodistension, I had a ton of frequency in nocturia. But luckily mm -hmm. I, I was able to retrain my bladder and, and everything's fine now, but I know there are so many people struggling with that and it, yeah. it definitely will affect you in your day-to-day -day life. I mean, if you have to go to work, like you're going to be a zombie and it could impact your performance there. It could really, it, it just so many different things in life that it gets in the way of. Uh, yeah. And I just remember even, you know, I worked in advertising for a long time and I used to be in meetings and these meetings would run, you know, for sometimes two hours. And I just sit there like I didn't want to leave. Um, but I sat there so uncomfortable because I just had to go to the bathroom. Oh, I always and think I didn't about, want to I always think about teachers. Like oh, they have teacher. a class that they can't leave. Terrible. <laughs> like Terrible. How? I know. how do you just, all do it? <laughs> they should all be well, kindergarten here they have a an like a an EA, an educational assistant. So the kindergarten or the kindergarten teachers have it a little bit easier because they get or there's a bathroom sometimes in the classroom. I don't know if they'd really want right. to use it. A bunch of five year olds. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's hard. There have been, you know, I've run support groups and there have been teachers and they've talked about how difficult that that is. Yeah. Um, I've had some clients who have had to go on like medical leave from teaching mm -hmm. because of their IC and that's that's huge I mean just not being able to go to work I, and staying home I mean there is a, a socialization factor of of working and obviously the finances you have to provide for yourself and your family so it can really derail you yeah it's so it's so it's a hard one it's a very very difficult one and, and I think the problem with it still is because it's not, you know, considered, it's not cancer, it's not heart disease, it's not diabetes, like it's not as well known. People have no, like when you, I'm sure when you said to people, told friends, family even, you tell them your symptoms or that you have IC and they're just like, they have no idea. They I don't, don't even it. usually say the the term interstitial cystitis if it's somebody that yeah. I'm not really like super close with I'll say I have a bladder condition it's similar to having a UTI all the time like just very yes. the simplest terms but I mean in terms of raising awareness that's not always like the, the best approach and I, I encourage people to try your best to you know name this when you're talking to other people about it because that's the only way we're going to raise awareness is to just tell people about it and I, I didn't ever hear of interstitial cystitis before I was diagnosed with it. Like I, I, I don't even, I think I, I learned about it on Google and was like, oh yeah, that sounds exactly like what I have. Um, oh my God, my cat's having a hairball in the back here. What's that? <laughs> my cat's having a hairball. <laughs> no. I can't hear it. Oh my God. Oh, now I, okay. A little bit. <laughs> Hi, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. okay she's okay you know that cats get icy yes oh my gosh that's so funny yes they do and mm, it feels it's like it feels like people with ic it's usually their cats that get icy i don't know <laughs> if it's like if there's a weird thing that's interesting that <laughs> Well, there, there's maybe the it's something to do with the nervous system maybe our if we have anxiety and a, a you know nervous system element like maybe we're like projecting that onto our pet onto the cats. <laughs> oh my god I didn't know there was a link between cat I see um people with IC and their cats having I don't know honestly but people 
I've heard from many people that their cats also have IC and, and they have it huh. as well. So it's interesting. I'd be curious to see if there is a link. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a study for down the road. I know. Um, the other thing that really annoys me is the stats for IC because the percentage of men is much higher than, I mean, they say it's like mostly women, 92% or some, you know, high number like that. It's not true. It's yeah. absolutely not true. There are so many men, they diagnose them with chronic prostatitis and they have IC. Yeah. And that's another piece that I think, you know, bringing more awareness um, to the condition, if there was more of like, I just, I, I really don't like that they, they label it a female centric condition. I really don't think it is a female centric condition. I mean, potentially maybe there's more women who have it, but there are plenty of men who have it too. And, you know, they're not getting diagnosed for whatever reason, you know, they're not going to their, see their doctor or just living with it. Um, but if you look at the symptoms of chronic prostatitis and you look at the symptoms of IC, they're very, very similar. So, mm -hmm. and there's a major mental health component involved in CPPS as well. So that's something that really annoys me. Mm -hmm. that they, you know, and I don't know if you personally, um, see any men in your, in your practice. Um, honestly, no, I am open to yes, it, yes. but men typically aren't yeah. reaching out to me or interested in the things that I offer. So it, it's definitely interesting that that is the case. Yeah. I mean, you did, did you not start like a support group for men? I, I men did. And, and it's just not taking um, off. Let me take a look at it because I feel like yeah. we've I just gathered yeah. quite a few. Da -da, let's see. We. Have... I just feel like the education behind IC is just, I mean, even I've spoken to conventional doctors um, and just them telling me how little they learn mm -hmm. in school about it and just how poorly and it's just been so long like it's not a new illness you know but I think I think doctors shy away from it also because there's not much they can do on their end yeah and that's why it's really like you really have to go the holistic route with IC I cannot stress that enough I mean yes there are medications you can take like amitriptyline and there was Almiron which I hope people aren't taking anymore um, because of the retinal vitulopathy <laughs> link but you know I mean there's it's just, it's, it's just, there isn't, and there's surgery. I mean, they barely, most people don't have their bladder removed unless they're in, you know, a severe, severe case. Mm -hmm. So there's your, your options, conventional medicine, medication, surgery. So clearly there's a lot that can be done for IC in the holistic space, right? I mean, diet being huge, mm -hmm. um, which you can talk to probably much better than I can. Um, but it's, it's massive. And I think, you know, I think you also stress because a lot of people tend to feel like they have to stick to the IC diet, which they don't, right? Oh. Because everyone's different. Maybe I can tolerate tomatoes and you can't. Maybe I can not have a glass of wine and you can. It's mm -hmm. like everybody's different. So it's really like that elimination diet is so important to, yeah. to figure out what you can. Because I remember when I... I was told, oh, try the IC diet. And I was like, so limited with what I could eat. It was just, and that can cause other issues too, right? Yeah. Eating absolutely. disorders and whatnot. So it's, it's a huge problem. And I think um, people like you, it's great because you're teaching people, no, you can still eat lots of foods and you can have a, you know, diet with more than five things in it, right? Yeah. I think um, that's that's a really important thing for people to know because I think it's it's hard for you know anybody who has limitations in their diet and I mean what the when you look at the IC diet it's like tomatoes citrus fruits alcohol everything that's like fun. goes on and on yeah it's a lot it's a lot yeah. and so. you know, we're coming into the summer season and it's like there's so many different social events happening I mean there's pool parties and beach trips and yeah whatever else you do in the summertime and and all of those things usually involve food or sure. drinks 
And so it's like, if you don't know what is bothersome to you, then you're going to be stressed. You're going to not enjoy yourself. You're going to wonder, is this food going to flare me? Or Mm -hmm. even like the stress of that triggering a flare and it's not even the food. And so that's why I really encourage people, you know, as long as they don't have any active like eating disorder type behaviors, I mean, do an an elimination diet to learn exactly what you're sensitive to, exactly what your limits are on those things, because you might be able to have a small amount of a food that you really enjoy and you might be able to indulge, but you'll never know those limits if you don't Mm -hmm. do the science experiment that is the elimination diet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, no, it's a big one. Um, and do you, um, bring in mindfulness at all into your program? Is it? So we don't have any like formal classes or anything like that, but we do encourage it, um, in our, we have a lot of discussions about it in our, our group calls or support group calls. I always make that sound weird. Um, yeah. But it is something that I I do support and I think a lot of people could benefit from. Yeah, no, it's so it's big. And I think a lot of people, I mean, like, I just remember when I started trying to meditate, I couldn't do it myself. Like, I was just like, this is not working for me. And I, you know, I looked at other ways. So for me, it's yoga. Like, I do yoga and that really helps. Um to just calm my mind and keep me um, grounded. But I think that's another piece. Like a lot of people are like, oh, meditation, I've tried it. It doesn't work for me. Well, okay, that's fine. But there's other things you can do other than just sit and meditate, right? Um, so that's a big one. I mean, I feel like people really need to, to understand that, um, right? Because it's just, yeah. it's not just, there's not just one option there's multiple Absolutely. options yeah and, and that sort of you know and and it's the same with that's the thing I think people with IC often feel limited um but there's it, it's not really limited like you just have to figure out what works best for you and then once you get comfortable then you have a practice that works and then you're sort of on your road to recovery no. yeah <laughs> <It's bigger>. <laughs> <laughs> I it comes even... up a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a good one. I mean, right? right? Yeah, <laughs> recovery, absolutely. Uh, um, and I think it's funny because you say, like, would you you say you're in remission, or do you say you have no longer have IC? Like, what would you say? I actually, a lot of people will ask me, like, how did you get into remission? And I literally will say, I don't consider myself to be in remission yeah. because. I, my biggest trigger is stress and stress is something that is really difficult to get a handle on. It's something I'm working towards and I've been working towards for years now. I'm not going to, you know, not be transparent about that. It's a work in progress. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I'm just a very high anxiety person. I've been like that my whole life. I struggled with this since I was a kid and IBS. So it's, you know, ingrained Mm -hmm. in DNA, um, so I, I call, I say I'm 95% symptom free and that 5% is okay. If I have a really stressful day, I might flare up if I, um, I don't know if, if I get like bad news or just some sort of stressful scenario, like there is mm. a chance that I can flare up. However, I know my triggers. I know, okay, I'm stressed. This is probably, I need to take some precautions. I need to drink water. I need to put the ice on my pelvic floor. Like I need to use all my flare busters and I can usually calm a flare in like 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really affect my life very much. Um, Mm -hmm. but to me, remission that, that wouldn't be remission to me. It would be, I I'd be completely rid of all my symptoms. I wouldn't have to worry about anything like Mm -hmm. food, meds, anything like that. But to someone else, I'm I'm in remission to someone else's, you know, definition. Yeah. I never like I'm also, I guess you know, there's a superstitious thing, but you know, people are like, oh, I find anytime someone asks me, like, oh, how are your you know, how are you feeling or whatever, I'm always like, well, today is good. I but I don't like to say, oh, I'm totally fine now. I just, you know, I'm kind of one of those like knock on wood kind of people. <laughs> and <laughs> so 
I never like to say, you know, when I'm going through a good period, I'll, I won't say, oh, I'm, I'm rid of it or I'm in remission. I'll just say, like, I'm going through a good period. Right. That's it's sort so of funny. how I feel. <laughs> we, I have, like to, yeah. we have clients who like every Wednesday in Road to Remission, we, we have like a Wednesday wins thread where people just share like their wins. And some people just won't share wins because they're afraid of jinxing themselves. Yes. You're not it's alone. <laughs> I know. I really just, yeah, I'm totally, um, <laughs> I, I, I do find like that, you know, when I do say, oh yeah, I'm good. I've, I've been, I've been a good, I've been in, you know, a good, good period. And then the next day I'll feel like crap. So I just mm -hmm. don't bother, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So yeah, but the, I, it's different for everyone, you know, like I, you know, when I hear people say, oh, I'm rid of it. I don't, I mean, you clearly have the condition still. I don't think you can really be rid of it completely. Um, yeah. So I feel like it's it's all about management, right? I think it, it depends. I mean, if you have Hunter's lesions, I don't know yeah. that there is anything that really cures that right now unless you- Well, they it. remove them, but then they yeah. often grow back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They, they yeah. typically come back. Um, so, but for the people without Hunter's lesions, whose bladders look, you know, normally healthy and maybe there's a little bit of inflammation, but um, for those people, it's like, okay, you might just have something that is causing your symptoms. It, is it a nervous system issue? Like last week we were talking to a, um, a therapist, I completely forget what her title was, but we were talking about how um people with nervous system regulation you know if you can get your nervous system regulated you know your your pain and your symptoms could absolutely go away and and that could be like a quote unquote cure i hate saying that word it, it like oh, yeah makes me cringe a little bit but yeah I, mean, I think it just depends you know what what the root cause is and if it's something that is treatable or if you remove it from your lifestyle, like it's possible. Yeah. But to me, that's management, right? Because if you bring it back in, is it going to come right. back? Right. So if um, it's right. right. So I'm just like, you, yeah. Yeah. I, I think like it just it's depends. all about managing, managing the condition, right. uh, which some people do very well and some people don't do very well. Right. I mean, it's, it all comes down to, the work you put in, right? I mean, it, it does, I would say IC does require work. Absolutely. I don't think it's one of those, it's not one of those, there's no quick fix, um, which is unfortunate, but it just is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a complicated condition. And I just think that I'd like to see, and I, and I have seen, you know, now people are using pelvic PT, which is great, who have IC. And then there's people who, who fear things like that too, right? Like, cause they're like, oh, well, I'm going to be put into a flare if I go for pelvic PT. Mm -hmm. I don't like anyone touching me or doing any internal work. So it's complicated because you kind of have to, cause I remember, I remember after, um, after I had my son, I had some really bad, like I had a C-section and I had really bad. So I guess like my core, I had a strong core and then it was like super weak because they cut through all my muscles. Um, and so my back was all of a sudden compensating for this weak core. And I'd have this like terrible back pain. Like I couldn't even carry like the car seat or like take the stroller out of the trunk and all these things it was terrible and the woman who I went to see the physiotherapist she's like can I please do pelvic PT and I was nervous like I really was I didn't really I was afraid to trigger anything like my bladder was doing okay and I didn't want to um trigger anything so she's like I really think that if I do pelvic PT it could help and I said no and uh and it probably took me a lot longer to get rid of the back pain than, you know, if I had gone that route. So, in, yeah, that's, it's a hard one, right? Because there is a fear around, um, often around that internal work. 
Yeah. Uh, I don't think that it is gonna help if you don't buy into it. Like for me, the first time it was mentioned to me and with my first therapist, like I was just like, I don't think this is going to really help me, but I'm going to do it because my doctor told me to. And I I wasn't really bought into it and like mm. a believer that it could help me. But a couple mm. years down the road, you know, I wasn't going. And then I decided, OK, I'm finally in a place where I understand what PT can do for me. I understand what the pelvic floor anatomy is and and the physiology behind it and and how much that can help me and then i i had a whole new like mindset shift about okay i'm really going to do everything they tell me i'm going to do my homework i'm you know going to work on my breathing whatever they tell me to do i'm going to do it because i understand now and and you know i don't know if that was like the case for you at all but that was my experience with it yeah I mean I think it's also like it really comes down to the person's headspace right where they're at their comfort zone Mm -hmm. um and you know I work with a lot of pelvic PTs and and you know through public health support and you know a lot of them deal I would say the majority of them I wouldn't say I see is their you know, number one patient who's coming to them. Like it's more, you know, things like um, prolapse is huge and, you know, prenatal, postpartum, um, vaginismus, endometriosis. Um, I see is there, but it's sort of, you know, when even when people are doing their, their guest blogs, I see doesn't usually come up. Um, with pelvic PT that much. Like they're not usually writing articles with uh, with that. Um, you know, if the trans population, it's big for incontinence. Um, so yeah, so I mean, and that's the thing, right? Like when you have a hypertonic pelvic floor, pelvic PT is harder than a hypotonic pelvic floor. Right. Because everything's tight and tense and yeah. Um, but so you have had, you, you've had, positive experience with it yeah yeah absolutely okay. um yeah that's, that's it's funny we're talking about this right now I I called my PT who I've been seeing for like two years now but I I stopped going because I I had a surgery on a Bartholin cyst that I had and I couldn't go to PT for a few months and so mm-hmm. I've been meaning to call them to get back on the schedule but deep down I knew that it was going to be a really long wait because that's mm-hmm. just what's happening all over the world right now there just doesn't seem to be enough pts and i (laughs) they're like we can get you on the schedule for october and i was like oh Oh my god that is just like please tell my therapist like if she can get me in earlier like i i will do anything like i that is so long like that's crazy you yeah, know, I haven't really come across that many pelvic PTs in Pennsylvania. Yeah, it's maybe there's a shortage. Maybe, but it seems like when talking to my clients, like they're they're all having weights like this. And I mean, That's I don't nuts. even think it's exclusive to physical therapists. I think it it's like also uro urologists, urogynecologists. Like, oh yeah. I think it just depends like where you're at and and what the population looks like. Yeah. See, I'm in Canada, so I would have thought in the States you'd be able to get anything like if you're paying you can get in whatever right? you want but you no, would think but not. no it's here yeah you've got crazy wait times I mean we don't cover like the health insurance that you know the government covers um is not does not include anything like public PT but it does include urology and urogynecology um yeah so that's not good I know it's not yeah that's that's interesting to know I'm gonna I'm gonna do my homework for you and find out (laughs) find some more public PTs in Pennsylvania I know Uh, I just really love my person and Uh, that's true once you're it's like a psychotherapist yeah like if you vibe with someone it's like you want to keep going there like it's it's that trust for sure yeah for sure no I agree that is definitely well yeah maybe did, did you go on the cancellation list or um yeah I I uh, asked him to do that for me so I mean but in the yeah. meantime I I have my own pelvic wand and I sort of know what to do with it it's just like I'm not confident 
I, I talked about this on a previous episode that we did recently, but like I, I sort of know, but I'm not like really confident in in doing that work. I'm always like, well, am I doing something that's yeah. gonna hurt me? Like I don't really know. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like you need a 101. Yeah, I don't put that on my site. <laughs> yeah, honestly, like I actually perused on YouTube, and there there was some videos. Was there anything? But, yeah, but. I don't know. Well, that would be a complicated one because yeah. it would be, I mean, did it have like a. They show you like a, on a model, like a. a I see. All the floor model, but it's kind okay. of hard when it's like. Yeah. Your pelvic floor is attached to your body. It's not like you're holding it out in front of you doing it. Like, it's just weird. <laughs> I feel like a pelvic PT would be best to yeah, yeah teach sure. how to use it best. Yeah. Uh, especially like everybody's different too, right? Like. Mm -hmm. you could have pain with one side and not with the other and it's just you kind of have to they kind of need to know your body yeah so and I've been yeah. I've been noticing when I, I do my wand work that the side that I had my Bartholin cyst on that's the side that is like more sensitive and, and tight and makes sense mm -hmm. but it's like, it I'm like how hard do I need to put pressure on this like I don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah so how long has it been since you had it has been surgery? since like the first two weeks of January ish is when I had that done okay so, it's been a, it's been, actually yeah. a decent amount of time that has flown by um the surgery wasn't bad uh, uh -huh. it was just like a recurring cyst that just kept coming back up I would get it uh I would get it drained in the office which is kind of painful and that would be painful they, yeah yeah, they were like, honestly, you should probably get this operated on. But I was like, you know, that sounds really scary. I don't want it to flare my IC. Like, I just kept getting it drained. And they're like, well, now you have scar tissue. And I'm like, great. So yeah. <laughs> we finally did it because I it, it got really, really big in like the, the holiday season. And then my family and I went to Key West on vacation and we did a jet skiing tour. And that was the most painful thing ever like just being on a jet kind of like being on a horse honestly with, oh. with I see like it was yeah. bad it was my wake up call I, I called them that day I was like I need to get in <laughs> yeah so they did it and it wasn't like a long recovery it was just no like, um okay. I mean I had a I had a drain in it or it was like a balloon type thing mm -hmm. I don't really know what it, it was called a marsupialization procedure oh okay um, so yeah, I, I had like this balloon drain thingy in for like a month and then they took it out. Oh. I just had to be, here. It, it was just uncomfortable, like knowing that there was a drain in there. I just had to kind of like, I wobbled oh. around a little bit, even though I didn't have to. <laughs> and did it bother your bladder? Honestly, it didn't. Like it was fine. Um, yeah. And I also really trusted the doctor that I did it with and, and her confidence really helped me get in the right mindset because I previously was seeing a male gynecologist who kind of would just manhandle me and it, it it never made me feel good and it would flare my IC like when doing like the speculum and the pap smears and stuff like that like it it was not a good experience and then I switched to this this woman and and she was great she would talk me through everything you know give it to me straight and I appreciate that in a practitioner absolutely it's yeah. good you switched yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I do feel, you know, I mean, I have a, I've had, well, I had a female urologist and now I have a female urogynecologist and I don't know how comfortable I would have, I you know what, when I first got IC, it was, it was a doctor, it was a male urologist who diagnosed me. And then I ended up getting into this excellent urologist through connections. I shouldn't even say that on <laughs> but, <laughs> He was amazing, but now she's retired and uh, it's honestly, that's another thing. It's just so hard for people to find mm -hmm. doctors here, especially people who there's nobody who wants to take on IC patients. They yeah, all want. They can't help us. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, they're really, like, it's just so frustrating because Dr. Curtis Nickel, um, who I'm actually going to be interviewing next week. I'm trying uh, to get him on my podcast. So that reminds me to reach out to him again. He said he was super yeah. busy before. So I'll reach out to he him. He is super busy. Yeah. So no, we'll tune in next Thursday. Um, because we're gonna be doing 
a I'm going to be interviewing him um through my YouTube channel okay and, we can link that in the show notes when this comes out in a few weeks yeah yeah absolutely yeah I know it's it's exciting um but he was like I, I call him the IC guru um you know of Canada he was in Kingston Ontario um which is just a few hours east of Toronto and uh he was amazing and he has someone who who's taken over, but again, Kingston, which is a much smaller population than Toronto. Toronto is really lacking in the IC since, you know, Dr. Carr um, retired. It's just, there's nobody who really takes, takes on IC patients or really is like focused on it. Um, it's, it's unfortunate. We, we need to change that. I mean, like, like you said, you know, <laughs> It's a difficult one. Um, and that's another reason why people need to turn to holistic, um, a holistic path, right? Yeah. And Carolyn Van Dyken, um, I don't know if you know who she is. So she no, is, no. she has a company called Reframe Rehab. So they train the public PTs with a bio, it's a biopsychosocial framework. So people like um, Jill Mueller, Anthony Lowe, Jilly Bond. Um, so they do the courses and they're all very focused on the biopsychosocial um, uh, framework. And Carolyn has even taken CBT training. So she's incredible. And Shelly Prosco, who's also big and we've got lots of her content on my site. Um, she pioneered physio yoga and uh, she has a toilet meditation on there that's really helpful for people with conditions, constipation, you know, irritable bowel syndrome, um, I see endometriosis. So I think it's been translated into like five different languages. So oh, great. it also sits on the site. So it's, it's helpful as well. Yeah. I mean, there's, that's a thing, like the site just has so much on there. I don't even think people realize how much is on there. Yeah. Um, looking and, and you have a lot of good stuff. I mean, a lot of free resources for people and you even connect them if they want something more like to work with someone that like you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Somebody like me. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm on your site and yeah. it's a great way to connect people with the practitioner that they are looking for. Yeah. No, it's, it's super helpful. Like I said, I just wish, you know, I mean, I should have done it 20 years ago, um, but I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> but it's there now for people to use and, you know, to familiarize themselves. I think, you know, that whole biopsychosocial, I think people sort of, the way we do it on the site is we, we explain it in a very easy to read way everything on the site is very concise. It's all bullet points. Like the thing is, you know, pelvic health is huge, right? Like there's so much, I think I cover over 40 conditions. Um, it's crazy how much is there. And I, it's funny, like, I'd love to see their, like, I'd love to see schools have pelvic health education. That is my, my next project is to bring it into schools. Like there is no reason why it shouldn't be. And the thing is like, People have no idea what to expect when it comes to, you know, they're going to be going through menopause and they're just like, oh, I don't know. I'll just, I'll just walk in blind. Mm -hmm. And there's so much, like there's so much that people don't know. And even people, you know, and, and bringing IC in, you know, it can totally change your IC symptoms as well. Um, the lack of estrogen and, and whatnot, you know, atrophy and all these things increase in UTIs. Um, so my goal is just, yeah, educate, 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 make sure people know, you know, what to expect. Even, even the postpartum period, people have no idea what to, what they're, you know, dealing with. They're just, they figure like childbirth, did it, done, have no issues after. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Right. Like the number of people who get prolapse and, and, and then they say, you know, oh, I, I, um, Whenever I uh, work out, I got, you know, I'll pee a little. And I figured that's normal because I had a baby and that's just what it is. No, it shouldn't be that way. People yeah, don't know. Society that. tells you. <laughs> but it's just like, you can fix that, right? Like there's so many things that are fixable. Um, 
And so, yeah, so it's, it's trying to help people understand that. Yeah. Um, Cause there's so much like just, there's no education out there. Public health. People have, to, there are people who, if you don't have pelvic floor issues, people don't even know what a pelvic floor is and what it does. I didn't know to being diagnosed with IC. Was that? I didn't know what it was or even have heard no. of it before IC. Me neither. Yeah. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And like how many functions it has. And, and it's just unbelievable that people have no clue. Like they have this hammock that's just <laughs> no knowledge. Like it's just, it's crazy to me that, right. that just people have no knowledge of what it does and, you know, how much it's responsible for. Um, so yeah, so, so I'm all about education. Yeah. Um, and then, like I said, I'm hoping, I would love to see um, schools take it on because it would be so helpful, you know? And even now, like kids, seven years old, um, girls are getting their periods at seven now. Wow, it's I didn't crazy. know that. Crazy. Is there any theory on why? I'm assuming it's hormones and the food. Whoa. So everything is like That's they're growing faster. Crazy. They're, you know, it's crazy. Like I cannot even imagine. I have a five-year-old, he's a boy, but um, <laughs> I just can't imagine like in a year oh. and a half I'm getting, you know, like it, that just boggles my mind. They're like right. babies. Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. So there I needs can. to be education. Like, can you imagine being a seven-year-old at school, getting your period, not even know it? Like, all of a sudden, the kid is bleeding and having no idea what's yeah. going on. Oh, my gosh. That would be terrifying. I'm going to think about this now for the next two months of my life and tell every single person I know that you just told me that information. So <laughs> I know. It's crazy. Like, the stuff that I've learned and just come across, and it's just mind-boggling even conditions that I didn't know like things like I don't know if you've heard of persistent genital arousal disorder yes yes like there are conditions that people and then ugh, they don't even know like no one knows and then there's people who suffer yeah you feel so isolated and, and thinking there's something wrong with you but I mean there these treat there's treatments I'm sure for all of these conditions yeah that you know? one's a bit complicated I mean there's stuff you can do but um that's a, that's a really difficult one. And then another big one is the trans population not knowing when they get surgery that they're going to have incontinence issues afterwards. Mm -hmm. I, like, I actually never thought about that. So that's a good point. It's a huge population and it's, it's like something, uh, luckily someone, um, one of the pelvic PTs did a piece. So I put it in all the trans groups. Um, so they're aware because I mean, this is the thing, right? Like they're, they're so, you want something so badly. You don't think about the after you just sort of, you know, it's the same thing with IVF. Like people don't think about the artificial hormones or whatever they're putting into their body. Um, and then, you know, if there's reproductive cancers that come up later, they're not going to think about that. So it's, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, I want this so badly. I'm not going to look at what you know, what's going to happen down the line. It's the same thing with amateur. Like, I know I need to get off amitriptyline 20 years of being on it. It's blocking a receptor. Like a short, I already have short-term memory loss. I'm like, I got to get off this, but I like what it does for me. So it's one of those things, you know, yeah. but yeah, that's why the more education, the better people need to know about these things. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So Speaking of your site, can you tell the listeners where they can get connected and is it something that yeah. you mean? Yeah, so absolutely. So the website is pelvichealthsupport.ca. Um, we were Canadian centric and now we are North American centric because our US traffic actually exceeded our Canadian. So clearly Ooh. it was a much needed resource in the US. Um, so we're just transitioning it so that it's a fully you know, North American centric site. Um, everything Americans can get everything off there just as Canadians can. Um, and I also have an Instagram page, uh, which is public health support and a Facebook page, which is also public health support and a Facebook support group, which is also public health support. Right. You got to stay consistent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But there's like the public health support Facebook page and the public health support support group. So yeah. yeah, so we have, we have all, so we're, we're, um, we're all, we're all 
there on social media and uh yeah so easy to access um free you know everything's free. free and uh there is you know the the membership just allows you to be a little bit more proactive but it's pay what you can so it's uh really just for people who you know there's some additional um meditative body there's a body scan there's um change your brain change your pain written by carolyn van dyke and it's just an ebook which helps you understand central sensitization um and the biopsychosocial approach and also you know restorative yoga rest your maxis card um if you need it i'll send it to you and uh yeah so it's you know got a, a bunch of extra little things there and it just helps support the site so it's yeah it's, like i said pay what you can i just i just changed it over um because i just want to make it accessible to everyone yeah that's amazing yeah um, no i i want to yeah. thank you for putting that all together i mean do you have a job outside of doing this no <laughs> You, you are well, being a mom but other than that no that is a job yeah that's yeah. a job it is that's a job. yeah <laughs> it is <laughs> yeah, well yeah thank you I mean on behalf of the IC and pelvic pain population I mean thank you for doing that and also thank you for coming on the show and and talking about this with us this is yeah and I really connect people with some some information that could change their life yeah absolutely that's the goal so thank you for having me yes